Obviously, the implications of adhesions to vasculature, specifically venous structures uh, immediately adjacent to the vein, very much impacts on what I do, and moreover, the safety and risk and complexity of what I do. Now, you take that a step further, because we're talking here about native operations. This is, say, first time the patient's had a procedure on the front of their spine. Uh, in a perfect world, that would be the last operation they have on the anterior portion of their spine. The reality and the, the, the statistics of it all would say that that's not always the case. The, the issue really for me um, became the recognition that that, that, that first index surgery, um, while it's critical that we do it perfectly and get a great outcome, the harsh reality is things don't always work out that way. And whether it's a case that I did initially or someone else did, I have to look at it as I'm prepared to come back into the space should things go awry. So my mindset really totally had to shift to thinking two, three, five steps down the road when I'm doing an index operation. It's not about, you know, how do I get in cleanly and provide excellent exposure? It's how do I approach these tissues, mobilize these vessels in such a way and plan to be able to get back in should the need arise. Now, obviously, perfect world, it doesn't, but the statistics would tell you it's, it's at least 1% of the time that you're going to be back there. And guys who do this on occasion would tell you, well, 1% of the time, I'm probably not going to encounter that patient. And that's probably true. The problem is when all you do is this procedure, right? 1% of the time adds up. And it carries not only morbidity risk, but mortality risk when you have to remobilize great vessels. And so that really led me to, to begin to investigate heavily uh, barrier products, things that I felt like could interface between the spine and the great vessels. So that index operation, you know, we're lifting the vessels completely off the spine and we're relocating them, right? The, the process of doing that induces tissue trauma. Just simply, no matter how clean your technique is, you've traumatized the vessels and soft tissue. Take it a step further, and I think this is where anterior and posterior surgery differ. Um, we then go traumatize the disc material, take all the disc material out, and then what we replace that with are spacers or other, other um, technologic devices that are oftentimes intended to form bone. And, and I can tell you as a non-spine surgeon, there's nothing more inflammatory than bone growth, bone formation. So you can imagine now we've traumatized the vein. Now we're setting it back on top of a pro-inflammatory environment that it's intended to be inflammatory. That's what we want. And so that thought to me was very disconcerting. Um, and so it became my priority to, at a bare minimum, try to keep those spaces separate try to prevent scar tissue from developing between the, the spine and the vessels, and then provide a, a, a platform that ultimately would maintain that separation of environments. Um, so, you know, again, this is early on, I, I sort of came up with my wish list for what I was looking for in a biologic uh, barrier product. And I think the key, the key components were, were first and foremost, survivability. Um, to me, a biologic tissue barrier has to function as a barrier first, because if you're not able to in inhibit tissue ingrowth, by definition, you're not really going to function well as a barrier. My personal preference and strong belief uh, in the product that I utilize uh, called Allowrap um, is that there are unique properties to various preparations of amniotic tissue. So I did a lot of homework before landing on, on this product as my go-to product. But um, if you look at the basic science and you look at the data that, that I've shown, um, the survivability of this product, which I think is, is of the utmost importance, if, if you want a primary adhesion barrier, the survivability is undeniable. Um, you know, in my personal practice, I have uh, gone back in for revision operations in, in cases where I've already operated on that patient. And I found viable product, histologically viable product up to nine months uh, post-operatively. This product has become my go-to. Um, and as you can see here, it, it comes in a couple of different formats, um, basically what's termed a wet. So it's kind of pre-soaked in saline uh, and a dry. The dry, I think, um, scares a lot of people off because it, it, it definitely looks tissue paper-like. 
Uh, and it is fragile. If, if you ripped at it, it would tear. Um, but I find that I actually like the dry product in the setting of, of anterior spine exposure um, because it tends to absorb the local fluid that's developed from the operation and then easily can form and almost stick to the spine preferentially. So my technique of application um, in, in any given procedure is to actually just lay the product down flat on the spine. And you'll notice uh, to the right screen right um, is the left common iliac vein um, that's been mobilized and exposed. And so I'll quite literally go in with a pair of DeBakey's here and I'll pick the vein up off the spine. And then I'm just gonna tuck the tissue barrier under the vessel itself. So that when I let the vessel back down, as you see here, the vessel's nice and happy. And it also ends up providing that additional mechanism of adherence, sort of pressing the barrier against the spine so that I don't have to physically fixate the barrier with suture or, or tacking material. And then I really just use the, the, um, the peritoneum itself uh, as the secondary reinforcement for that adhesion barrier. So when the, the peritoneum rolls back over the barrier, it really snugs it into place. Um, again, in my professional experience going back in and revising these cases, um, the barrier is remarkably intact and it's remarkably in the same location where I left it. I'm really focusing on not only adhesion prevention, but truly separating those, those uh, local environments so that I have these soft, fragile soft tissue structures separated by a physical barrier to that hyperinflammatory bone formation process that's going on uh, in, in between the vertebral bodies. I'd simply point out that while the cost of an amniotic tissue barrier may seem high on the surface, um, what we really have to consider is the actual cost of scarring. Um, and can we put a number to that? I think we can. If you consider then that you know 10% of all patients undergoing spine surgery will ultimately need revision, it says to me, we're going to be back in these spaces. And we have to really think critically not how we do the index operation, but how do we do the index operation to present the, the safe opportunity to reaccess that space if reoperation becomes necessary. So that's kind of my frame of reference when I have to go to a new product committee and justify my use of a, of a human amnion barrier product uh, as it relates to my practice. So I'd encourage the audience to kind of think holistically about this process and the decisions they're making um, in context with their patients. Um, and I imagine most of us, if not all, um, will see the value of utilizing tissue barriers uh, more often in our practices.